Welcome, listeners, to another edition of Matt Christman's Inebriated Past. Not sure if this one should technically be called an intoxicated pa- past, but I'll leave that to the historian. So today I want to talk about a subject that is incredibly important to understanding contemporary American culture, especially the uh, the political culture that we find ourselves basically trapped within this nightmare realm where we're just dealing with paranoid, clannish, irrational uh, groupings that uh, totally obscure the actual stakes of play in politics. And it's very frustrating. So I wanted to talk about that subject, and that is conspiracy theory. And I want to talk today about the history of conspiracy theories throughout America. From the dawn of the Republic and even before to, to now. Uh, and I feel like this will give us a good understanding of exactly where we are, why we're there, and what it says about our politics. So uh, I'm saying this just to let you know that I'm going to be breaking this down into two chunks. First chunk will be a chronological description of the place, the conspiracy theory held in American culture throughout American history. The second part, I'm going to give some theories I have about conspiracy theories and how we should think about them. Now, I am doing a broad historical overview, but I think we need to remember that conspiracy theory culture, the kind that is relevant in the current moment, is very specifically grounded in late 20th century uh, era of deindustrialization and mass media saturation. It doesn't really make sense to talk about conspiracy theories in the 19th century and conspiracy theories in the 21st, and they're not really referring to the same thing, and I think that needs to be remembered. But I'm just still going to give the full overview just so you can see the way that the material reality changes things and kind of directs the flow of, of culture. Uh, and another point of clarification, when I'm talking about conspiracy theories and conspiracy theory culture, it's not necessarily contained within it all of the verified and understood machinations of the U.S. covert operations and intelligence communities. Those, the, the assassinations, buggings, uh, experiments on human subjects, all part of the record and all part of statecraft for 20th century and 21st century capitalism. And those things, I want to stress, are distinct from conspiracy theory culture and the narratives of the conspiracy theories, but are also integral to them. And when we get talk later on in the chronological breakdown, we talk about uh, the birth of the post-war conspiracy theory culture, uh, I'll get more into what the connection is between the objective reality of covert operations and government secrecy and the fanciful conspiracy narrative that would be inspired in some cases by those real acts. So we'll get into that later. So if you're talking conspiracy theory culture in America, you have to start when there's a time of mass culture. So conspiracy culture in America can't really be thought of as a coherent thing uh, until you have the mass newspaper culture of the early 19th century, uh, which also brings with it a, a big ferment uh, uh, of things like West, of Western expansion, uh, the conflict over slavery, the rise of financial and industrial capitalism is very important. Uh, and shit was changing, and it was making people uneasy and disempowered. This is the, also the era of the rise of the Industrial Revolution, so people are finding themselves thrown off of the land and into uncertain, uh, degrading work and in the mechanic shops of the East Coast cities, there had to be some sort of party responsible for this. Uh, And as we know, this is an era before class consciousness really had begun to even twinkle into existence in such a a, a nascent working class, right? So there is no such real thing as class consciousness or class understanding. There's just the yeoman farmers of America who think of themselves as all independent individuals uh, totally responsible for their own destiny. Government's only there to help them carry it out, uh, finding themselves restricted in ways and, and, and 
having their lives disrupted in ways that they could not have fucking ever imagined. Uh, and that made them feel out of power. It made them feel powerless. Uh, and there was no way to understand that relationship uh, because there was no language of class to express the mutual feelings of all the people suffering it. And so people had to come up with their own ideas. And during that early period, uh, you know, there were different pointing fingers pointing at different places. Some people pointed at uh, the Eastern bankers. Some people pointed at the, the slaveocrats of the Southern aristocracy. Uh, and those all had some material basis, but there was one group that became an abstracted uh, force for evil, causing all the other maladies uh, in society. And those were the Freemasons. Now, the Freemasons, as anyone knows, are basically kind of a more pretentious rotary club or like Kiwanis, you know, like the, like the Elks Club like to get nude in the, in the banquet halls, that kind of thing. It's just a kind of frou-frou, more self-consciously sort of middle, uh, bourgeois uh, version of, the, uh, of a fraternal organization. But the thing about it is, is that because they take the cream of the urban middle class, the people who make made the first wave of, of revolutions in Europe, and from the French Revolution to the revolutions of 1848, that class uh, having this group of that they would get together in, talk about politics, talk about improving man, creating this notion that man is to be improved, and there could be a plan. Like the the plan of the of the Grand uh, Mason, you know, the the architect behind everything, and that you can push something in that direction, uh, and the fact that they tended to not be affiliated with traditional uh, religious institutions, it made them incredibly suspicious. And in America, the spark that let this wave of Masonic paranoia uh, was the disappearance of a man in western New York named William Morgan who had been out and about claiming to have a Masonic secrets he had learned inside the organization that he was going to tell the world. He was writing a book about the evils within Masonry that he had, he had found by infiltrating them. And uh, while, while he was on this campaign, he disappeared without a trace, and he was never found. And so the belief of many people in Western New York is that this was a case of this group murdering a man. He was the Seth Rich of the 1820s, okay? And the furor about his uh, supposed death became, or uh, I mean, his alleged death became so frenzied that it actually led to the formation of a political party called the Anti-Masonic Party. It was formed in upstate New York uh, in 1828, and it was a single-issue party, and the issue was destroying the power of the Masons, which they claimed was behind all the other, uh, all other powers in the country and responsible for all the ills of the country. And what's so interesting about it is, is that it really did graft people's pre-existing material hostilities onto a narrative that made sense of them. The Masonic Party didn't last very long. It only was around for a few years, uh, it won a few local uh, seats, but it, it collapsed shortly after that. Many of the people from the anti-Masonic party ended up joining the Whigs, and from the Whigs became the basis for the uh, Republican Party. In fact, one of the chief founders of the anti-Masonic party, uh, Thurlow Weed, you want to talk 19th century names, Thurlow motherfucking Weed uh, later became the chief advisor uh, and aide to William Seward who was the preeminent Republican politician, governor of New York, uh, and uh, came in a close second to Lincoln for the 1860 Republican presidential uh, nomination. So this guy was, the, the line from the Anti-Masons to the Republican Party uh, uh, that overthrew slavery is a straight one because a lot of those people were abolitionists and they saw in the Masons the hand of the slaveocracy. And so they were able to make sense of it that way. Others might have seen, uh, you know, uh, just Eastern capital as being the, the, the force that the Masons represented. Either way, it became a locus of anti, um, 
Southern and specifically anti-Jacksonian politics in upstate New York uh, because Jackson was well known to all at the time, a Mason, much like the founding fathers had all been. And because his style of government had been so alienating to his opponents because he was so high-handed by dissolving the Bank of the United States by fiat, basically, uh, that they called him King Andrew. And the idea of him being this wannabe dictator was very strong. So the idea of this guy representing this ancient shadowy organization as president was very tempting to people in the North. In fact, the party that ended up rising to oppose Jackson's Democratic Party, the Whigs, uh, named themselves after the faction in the British Parliament that was opposed to the king's prerogative. I mean, that was a self-conscious attempt to say, we are against kingly government. And so King Andrew became this figure that alienated many across the country, and they saw behind him some evil force. And for the people in uh, the burned-over districts, the righteous uh, uh, second-grade awakened districts of upstate New York, uh, it was the Masons behind him. It was the godless Masons. So that was the first expression of uh, conspiracy theory as a cultural element of, of American culture. All right. Um, so now, a lot of these anxieties and hostilities that were represented in the anti Party, they ended up getting resolved by a little thing we like to call the American Civil War, uh, in which slavery was put paid to as an issue of national division. Uh, and as a result, conspiracy theory kind of broke off into just you know, the culture of, of a country literally riven by civil conflict, which you could argue is sort of the end state of any culture that is getting neurotically obsessed with conspiracy theories. Uh, but that's another idea and one that we probably shouldn't think about too hard without getting bummed out. So conspiracy theory really re-enters the larger cultural conversation in the post-World War II uh, era of the first Red Scare. Because the Victorian era had been the process of the American working class coming into its own. Going from this scattered organization of greasy mechanics and mudsills who had made up this unorganized working class around the era of uh, the anti-Masons. After the Civil War, the rapid industrialization and capital accumulation created this supercharged environment whereby class consciousness emerged very quickly. And you had a huge explosion in labor militancy all throughout that era from the Knights of Labor to the American Federation of, uh, the American Federation of Labor to uh, eight-hour uh, workday protests, massive actions like the Homestead Strike, the Pullman Strike, the bloodiest history of, of labor conflict in the West of any country in Europe uh, uh, or North America, for sure, and of industrial uh, unionism, anyway. And so there wasn't really a space for conspiracy theories because instead everybody was pointing their head in the right direction. Everybody could see the hand of capital at work in their lives and were combining to try to defeat it. So conspiracy theory was, it was sort of squeezed out of the marketplace of ideas. It was only when the first Red Scare, though, when this, Amer this rising tide of socialism, which by that point had, there was a socialist party that was contesting elections. Gene Debs got over a million votes running for president. And then you had the IWW, this model, this syndicalist model for industrial unionization on of the entire American working class and then the creation of a single revolutionary general strike. I mean, that was really something that was on the agenda in these guys' middle-term uh, aspirations. And, and then you had, you know, the business unionism of the AFL uh, getting concessions uh, from management through uh, negotiation. So this huge tide had to break against something. And in America, thanks to this, the Russian Revolution and... Um, the general reactionary nature that is un of culture that is unleashed by warfare, in this case fighting World War I, they were able to take that energy and use it to scaremonger people uh, about this enemy within that needed to be wiped out, uh, this scary foreign radicalism that was had nothing to do with American culture or American people, was imported from outside, not part of us, certainly not a product of our horrible industrial exploitation. 